we'll just start. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's absolutely a pleasure for me today to have one of the foremost authors, thinkers, and historians uh, today with us. His name, he is none other than William Dalrymple. In fact, Thank he's the person uh, who does not need any introduction. He's a celebrity of sorts. Uh, if you actually see him uh, on the street, you will actually see a lot of people hounding around him. Uh, so he's that popular. So he's probably Amitabh Bachchan of the literary field in India. And that's how it should be. Uh, but one of the most prolific- I, I wish all this were actually true. It's very kind of you. <laughs> but I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying this fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so, like even if it is beyond whatever, but I think it is true in many, many ways. In fact, my Hindu Malini, what I need. <laughs> sure, and uh, and other than that, I think uh, well, one thing which I should tell that he's been he's written some amazing number of books. He's done documentaries. He's written for the New York Times. Uh, he's written for the New York Review of Books, the New Yorker, the Guardian, and so on and so forth. So, uh, I think. This is one person who does not need an introduction. We just should really dive into the conversation and really understand from him his ideas of life and things. So, William, thanks a lot for joining in. But just, I would just like to start uh, with your pursuit on this whole idea of understanding India. I think it's been your long, lifelong, uh, what I call, work that you focused on India, history of India, things around it. And so, what got you into it? Complete accident. Um, I grew up in Scotland. Uh, my family had been associated with India um, for 400 years. Uh, there was a, a direct forebear of mine in the Black Hole of Calcutta in, in 1750s. And my family were from exactly the class that filled the East India Company's ranks. We were um, Scottish gentry with with greater social ambitions than bank balances, uh, who had to keep sending younger sons out to the colony, uh, generation after generation, uh, to uh, maintain the social aspirations. Um, but none of this was in my childhood. I, I grew up in Scotland, completely unaware of any link at all. There was nothing in the house that was clearly and obviously India. I mean, some old Raj families, you know, you go in and they have uh, elephant's legs being used to keep the umbrellas in the front hall and, and, and everything else to go with it. But there was absolutely nothing connected with India at all in my childhood. I knew that my father um, had been at partition uh, and had found it very tra traumatized um, and had seen, I think, horrible things. He'd been in the middle of all the massacres and everything uh, in his teens. Uh, and I knew vaguely that there were other family members that had been involved in various imperial and East India Company events. But it was totally marginal to the life I led, which was a, a provincial Scottish upbringing. Uh, I was interested in history and archeology, span and I always thought I'd be an archeologist. I, I would go to Iraq and dig. Um, I, I saw myself as, as a sort of uh, Indiana Jones figure, I think, rather than anything else in my, in my dream world, at least. Um, and uh, I spent my summer holidays on excavation. Um, and wanted to go to Cambridge to study archaeology. And that was just upended completely when the Iraq plan that I'd formed uh, was cancelled because Saddam Hussein closed the British School of Archaeology, which he said was a nest of British spies. It probably was. I never got there. I never found out. But for which my life might have been quite different again. But, uh, um, and I just ended up jumping on a plane with a friend uh, who was teaching in Derudun. Um And frankly, I kind of never left. I'm still here. I'm now, I was, I, what was I? I was 18 then. I'm now 56. And my entire adult life has been spent in India. I've, I've been a different sorts of writer in that time. I started off as a foreign correspondent. I've been a travel writer. Um, I have been a critic. Uh, an art historian, um, uh, but particularly over the last 20 years, I've been a historian of the East India Company um, and written four big books, uh, which are just next month being issued in a box set called the Company Quartet. So they're going to be issued in a sort of big solid thing that you can you know, keep the door open with or hurl at your children if they misbehave or something. <laughs> So at least you picked up one thing in uh, Indian, and that is hurl things at children. 
<laughs> I mean, I hope, I hope not literally, but uh, <laughs> but it, at least in in, <laughs> uh, in principle. So yeah, so I, I mean, I, I this has been my home all my adult life. Um, like anyone, you know, I can find India frustrating, and uh, and at times, you know, when the electricity goes or you're stuck in a traffic jam or something, it can be an uh, infuriating place. But it's never boring. Um, and it's always fascinating. I still don't even begin to claim to understand it most of the time. Um, and yet it's, you know, it's like as a writer, you know, I've been always a child in a sweet shop. There is so much here to write about, so much that is extraordinary. Um, and as I say, I've written about different aspects of religion, history, politics. Um, it's all fascinating, but it's particularly history that uh, I've spent most of the last uh, 20 years engaged in writing. I've been very lucky in that there was this gap. There were two gaps, I suppose. And one was that history in India had become very much a matter of uh, academic writing, often in, often couched in post-colonial and post-modernist jargon that was completely inaccessible to most people. Um, and there were none of the sort of writers that you get uh, in the West, like, say, Simon Sharma or Anthony Beaver or Linda Colley, uh, uh, write, major scholarly writers who wrote at the peak of uh, uh, academic uh, uh, research and, 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 and with great accuracy and scholarship, but also wrote English that was there to be read, that was to be enjoyed, that could uh, make it up the bestseller list. Uh, there were no books uh, like The Swerve. Um, you know, which would sit at the top of a bestseller list um, while also being a work of considerable scholarship. So I found that there was this great hunger for narrative driven, by uh, biographically driven histories, um, which were readable. Um, and there is a bit of a crisis now because there's a whole generation come up who not only don't like the style that uh, history has been written in, but uh, the, the, the post-colonial historians in India were all very much the far left. Um, they were in that Nehruvian Marxist-influenced generation that modern Indians distrust, frankly. Um, and, uh, and so, as I say, there was a gap. Then there was another absence, which was this entire period of history between the Mughal Empire and the Raj, which to me was a fascinating period of transition. This was the period when uh, the Mughals had gone into decline and, and from being um, the world's premier economy, one of the few moments in history when India's economy is bigger than that of China. Uh, there are two moments in history when that's true, and this is one of them. Um, but the Raj hasn't happened yet. And there is this period between the death of Aurangzeb in, in 1707, and the uh, creation of the Raj uh, in 1858, uh, which is a period of 150 years, which is an extraordinary period when a lot of the most interesting buildings in India are being built, the most beautiful paintings are being painted, a period of huge cultural efflorescence, but utter economic political confusion. Uh, and out of this confusion with the Marathas, the Mughals, the Hyderabadis, various Maharajas, Rajas, and Nawabs and Nizams all competing. Out of this, bizarrely, a trading company comes out on top. It's like you have, uh, you know, uh, four or five armies competing, and Facebook emerges as the victor uh, at the end of this. Uh, and this is the, this was the point that I thought was very interesting. That people, both in Britain and in India, were talking very much about the British with the capital B, as if everything that was going on in India was being directed from Downing Street. But it was far more sinister than that. It was, uh, it was a company, a private limited company run by a director and answerable to shareholders. And that was something which was not at all clear in either the post-colonial writing or in the old writing of the Raj, both of which, whether from an Indian uh, uh, perspective, uh, uh, wanting uh, uh, a nationalist Azadi narrative, or from a British uh, perspective, uh, celebrating the great deeds of empire. Uh, both of them ignored the fact that this was being done by a corporation operating out of an office in the city of London. Uh, and in an age when we were seeing the rise of 
these enormous mega companies like Amazon and Facebook and Google and Microsoft, um, who had the ability to weave their way around national taxes and national laws and to operate in a, in a strange world of their own. It seemed to me that, you know, that there was a, a, a story which was not being told. And that was what I spent the last 20 years telling. It's four books. The, uh, I didn't write them in chronological order, but the chronological order in which they will now appear uh, is, uh, is, is the first volume is The Anarchy, uh, which I've got here, the Indian edition in my hands, which takes the story from the time of Shakespeare uh, and uh, the time of Jahangir in India uh, through to um, uh, through to the time of uh, the great victory over the Marathas in 1803. The second volume is called White Moguls, and it's it's a micro story of a love affair which took place in Hyderabad, and it's from the great sort of expanse of the anarchy, we sort of focus in on one story, which is very telling because the, the British resident falls in love with this uh, this Persian girl and um, and converts to Islam and starts uh, uh, working as a double agent against the East India Company. So it, it's a fascinating sort of micro story. Then the third volume is Return of a King, which talks about the East India Company's failed attempt to take over Afghanistan, which has many echoes with our own troubles in, in Afghanistan at the moment. And finally, there is the last Mughal, which tells the story of Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last Mughal emperor who was put at the figurehead uh, behind what Indians call the first war of independence and what the British call the Indian mutiny, the great uprising of 1857, which was the largest anti-colonial uprising in history and a fascinating and gripping uh, moment. Um, and, and so anyway, these, these four volumes are now complete and uh, uh, they're about to come out, as I say, as this great uh, box set, um, putting, putting together two decades of work. And I'm now off into a completely different field. I'm, I'm writing about ancient India, something that's interested me, which I've had no uh, uh, particular authority on until this point. So, and I'm loving uh, doing something completely different for Jane. Very exciting. Look, this is so fascinating. In fact, I think uh, I would really say that everybody should read the quartet as you're saying. Uh, but then I have many questions as to your points, what you've actually said until now. Uh, so the first one, uh, which I say, like you said that you never found India to be boring. You've always found it to be very fascinating. And probably you also said that India is also full of dichotomies. Uh, well, what is it that, you, that fascinates you about India so much? Well, over the, I mean, I, I say I've been here since I was 18, um, on and off. And I mean, that's 30 years now. And at different times, different things have interested me. I mean, I, I've been very passionate about politics at times. Um, and, have, you know, as a foreign correspondent, I've, I've, I've written long articles on Indian, Pakistani and Afghan politics. At other times, the colonial history has been my main obsession. That's a, as we were saying uh, recently. Um, the art history is something which, which has been a, a, a consistent interest and in whether writing about Chola bronzes or the, the sculpture of the Pallavas or the design of temples, uh, right through to the company school painting, which is my most recent, uh, I've done, I've uh, curated two exhibitions, one of late Mughal and another of, uh, of, of early company. Uh, painting, one in New York, one in London. Um, so different times, different things have, have, have attracted me. And what's lovely is that, you know, in a sense that having got a readership, I've been able to cherry pick uh, in a way that, say, an academic with a tenured chair would not be able to if you are uh, sitting in a university. In a sense, you're, you're expected to carry on and drill away. You know, Romula Thapa is supposed to write about ancient India and, and, and no one expects her to pop up writing about the colonial period. So, um, uh, luckily, as a writer, without uh, a, a university affiliation, I'm really free to follow my interests. And uh, while for 20 years the colonial, early colonial period has been my focus, I've, I've, I've been able to um, pursue my interests as they've, as they've developed and, and luckily seem to have taken my readership with me so far. <laughs> Let's see where, where, where they come in. 
can I say that you're making a suggestion that if you want to be a popular writer, don't be an academic? Well, funny enough, it's, it's uh, no, it's, I wouldn't put it like that. I, I, I wouldn't describe myself as a popular writer in the sense it sounds like slightly like being a sort of, you know, writing Enid Blyton's or Barbara mm -hmm. Cartland's sort of trash or something. But my guru as a writer of history was um, the great Professor Sir Stephen Runciman, who was the great medievalist who um, I was never actually taught by. He, he, he'd already retired by the time I came in, but his books were my absolute passion. And I knew him when I was at Cambridge. He used to come occasionally and give lectures, and I made friends with him. Um, he was in his 80s, I was in my 20s. Um, but he advised me very clearly, uh, advice that he himself had been given, is that if you want to be a writer, leave academia. And so after about 20 years of teaching at Cambridge, he went moved to Scotland, uh, bought himself a, a Scottish tower house, a medieval castle, effect, and wrote these great series of books on the Crusades and Byzantium. And again, you know, he was able outside academia, although he had been an academic and had been, you know, a very distinguished professor of, of medieval and Byzantine history at Cambridge. Out, having left academia, he was he was able to take these great sweeps of history, which professional historians in that period and, and today, but particularly I think in the 50s and 60s, had been less and less willing to do, preferring to take some small guarded castle and, and make it their own special territory from which they could fend off all academic uh, adventurers trying to enter their little patch. Um, and Runston, you know, wrote three volumes on the Crusades, which is a great monument, uh, and a whole series of amazing books on medieval history uh, of the Mediterranean. He was a very talented linguist. He could read more or less every European language, plus Arabic, Turkish, Armenian, uh, and, uh, and, and Persian, and was able to access all the primary sources in the original, but yet was also a great prose writer who read prose that, you know, you wanted to read. Um, and he said that, he always said that he lamented that that link between fine prose and the writing of history had been lost, that, you know, in the days of Gibbon, um, people would queue up to wait for the latest installment of the decline and fall of, of, of the Roman Empire. Um, and, and that historians, took the writing of their book as seriously as they took the research. While in his, his day, he said, you know, serious academics didn't think that they had to write beautifully in the way that, say, novelists would try and write fluent and, and attractive prose. Um, and I think that's changed slightly. I think, you know, you now have a whole body of historians who write beautifully and, uh, and do dare to take on big sweeping subjects. You now, Peter Frankopan's uh, Silk Route again. He's a he's a very much a, a Runciman Chella. Uh, he he very much looks to Runciman's um, advantage. Um, people like Stephen Greenblatt at Harvard, writing books like The Swerve, sat at the top of the New York Times bestseller list for uh, six months. Won a Pulitzer. Yet you know is a serious work by one of the world's greatest living Shakespeare scholars. Um, and so you know. This, this was something which I found that in India simply was not happening, that there were many, many very fine scholars, um, but they tended to be working in the Subaltern Studies Collective, writing sort of uh, post-colonial, often neo-Marxist uh, uh, work that was in often an incomprehensible post-colonial gobbledygook. Uh, and, and very few of them were taking narrative or biographically driven subjects. So that was a patch I was able to, a hole I was able to fill. Uh, now, I think, you know, partly I think seeing, you know, how I've been able to make a living, a lot of younger writers are coming up now, very good ones like Manu Pillai, uh, Ara Mukoti. Uh, and then of course, for, for more, more modern history, there's someone like Ram Guha, who's my, uh, the older than me has been doing this as well. But he was, he's working in a very different chronological patch to me. He, he's, he's the, end of the colonial period and, and, and post-colonial. Um, but it's, yeah, it's changing now. But it, I mean, I, in a sense, I'm very lucky to have had a clear run. I think, you know, a British author writing novels about it would find 
you know, the territory very crowded with people like Aaron Dutton Roy and, uh, uh, you know, a million brilliant tile, um, uh, Janice Parriott, uh, uh, Salman Rushdie, Vikram Set, Amitav Ghosh, you know, there's a, there's a million brilliant post-colonial Indian novelists. Uh, and there is no Paul Scott, but I have been able to uh, create a little patch myself, I think, um, which has straddled the, you know, the world of serious history while being read by large numbers of people. And I'm very lucky, I feel, to, to have had that opportunity and, and for that vacancy to have been there. It might be more difficult. <laughs> so, this, this is fascinating, William, but then just a curious question, you know, like there is also this, absolute desire by Indians to learn about history that seems to have emerged in the last few years. Uh, and uh, But then of course, alluding to your point itself, like there's also this whole thing that you want to look at history from a very different eye or a very different lens. What do you think is driving this change? Because you've been in the middle of it. You, you've actually had a great influence in terms of what you, through what you've written, uh, through your prose and through uh, what you've been able to propound. So I think there's several answers to that. One is that, you know, there's been a great revival of interest in, in the writing and the reading of history every If you go to a British or an American bookshop, you'll find the same thing, that there are, you know, every year, new biographies of all, all the American presidents, uh, uh, new work on Stalingrad, or every year, 20 more books are written on the Second World War in Britain. You know, the British have the obsession with the Nazis, and Spitfires, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that has come late here, but it's come. And there is now a, a, a big market in, in narrative and biographical history in India. Um, but as I say, there was, there's also this feeling, I think, that history was very much written, A, by the left, uh, often the, the Marxist left. And there is, a, uh, you know, obviously, we're in an age with, which is strongly dominated politically now by the right. Uh, so there's a feeling that that uh, they've been given one version of history, which isn't the whole truth. Um, and there's also just the simple fact that the, the language which history was being written in uh, for the last 20 years is, is deeply inaccessible. Um, historians used to tie themselves up in, in post-colonial jargon. Um, and that's all very well if you're dealing with your colleagues, but it leaves ordinary people out in the cold, uh, unable to understand or be interested in uh, what's going on in, in the historical academic establishment. And that's all changing now. And in a sense, uh, it's good. I mean, I, it's an odd situation, India, whereby where I come from in Britain, we have right-wing historians and we have left-wing historians. Most writers probably are of the left or the liberal, uh, liberal left, but there are plenty of perfectly respectable right-wing historians who are serious scholars, and while you may disagree with them, that you know, no one would deny that their that their research is 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 valid, and uh, and and, and, and uh, that their work is as academically respectable as that of the left. But in India, there was this odd situation where certainly for the last, most of the last twenty years, there were no right-wing writers here, um, and still to this day, there's an absence of top class right wing right there are very few people in india that would you know british historians like neil ferguson and andrew roberts who are of the of of the the, the right um but also you know get top reviews win prizes and and and, and hold the the serious chairs of history there are no equivalents to that here uh, and the right wing historian um who try to fill that gap, people like Rajiv Malhotra are deeply problematic academically um, and have frankly no academic qualifications. So there is a there is the problem here, which is in a sense why this shakeup is taking place. Uh, you know, if you are a right winger looking critically at Indian history and not liking a lot of what you see in the Mughal period, you'll be hard pressed to find a well-written, well-researched, academically respectable book, which gives your point of view. Uh, and so there's a slight feeling, I think, if you go on Twitter, a, a sense of some sort of conspiracy as if there's, you know, why is the, why is the left dominating uh, this world and so on. Um, and 
while that can be very damaging if you have a sort of cleansing in academia whereby a right-wing political establishment sort of point, puts in unqualified people into senior positions and, and gives them the certification to teach and, uh, and, uh, and, and form the dominant narrative. I think it's a good thing. It's always a good thing when there's a shake-up when there's uh, ideas are uh, questioned and uh, and new uh, new understandings come out of that process. Um, so I'm uh, you know and, and I think there's you know there's no doubt as as is said every day by the right wing on Twitter that the amount of iconoclasm and destruction in medieval India was underwritten by the Marxist. Neruvian scholars of the 50s who, in the aftermath of partition, made the very understandable decision not to inflame sectarian hatreds, but arguably did uh, underplay the amount of destruction of temples, for example, which took place during the Sultanate period, um, when large numbers of, of, of beautiful buildings were destroyed. No question. Um, so, this is, you know, the, the history. Uh, uh, Francis Fukuyama talked about the end of history and was rapidly proved wrong when uh, you know history carried on to, to everyone's no one's surprise except his man. Uh, and uh, you know every generation needs to keep rewriting history and, and that is going to go on. Um, uh, but um, yeah, no, I think it's an it's a, an interesting moment. There are certainly perils if if we end up in a situation where we have. Uh, again, not a a, 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 a left-wing one-party state as had, was the situation under the 50s and 60s with Congress. Uh, and it's replaced now with a one-party right-wing state where the BJP dominates everything in a massive monolithic fashion. Uh, for democracy to thrive, obviously, you need a strong government and a strong opposition. Uh, and Britain and America have both been lucky in that they have had systems which have allowed um, that to happen, you move from right to left and back again as, as there are swings over the decades. Um, but in India, there is a tendency for everything to be much more monolithic. As I say, the, you know, the Congress dominated with the very socialist agenda throughout the entire period from 1950s up to the 80s. Uh, and um, I think we're in for a long period now, obviously, of, of BJP rule since the, the opposition has, has disappeared out of sight. No, so this is clearly, of course, for people to decide as to who they want as their leaders and what, what they want. But then uh, coming back to one very important point, you know, like you said that India was annexed by a corporate enterprise. Uh, so in present world and in the present context, and this is something very important for us to really uh, understand as well, and that's the whole idea of corporate imperialism. Uh, are we going to go through similar kind of thing with the rise of large enterprises? How do you really look at it? Because how can we learn from history? Because this, this enterprises like the Twitters of the world, the Facebooks, the Googles, they're just way too large. They have way too information. They know way too more about us than we know about ourselves and such, and th such things. Well, this, this is very much the point behind my company quartet, particularly the anarchy. Um, when I was writing the anarchy, that the fact of these vast companies was becoming more and more part of the uh, mainstream dialogue. And so I very much wrote the uh, anarchy with that in mind that, 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 and emphasized very strongly the fact that, uh, as was undoubtedly the case, that the East India Company was not the British government. Uh, it, it was a, a, a private company run uh, out of an office in Leadenhall Street. A small office, a win, uh, 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 an office with just four windows wide, uh, much smaller than most corporate headquarters today. And yet that company had an army twice the size of the British Army. In 1799, just before Britain rearmed to fight Napoleon, the British Army was only 100,000 men, while the East India Company Army was 200,000 men. Uh, and so it was an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary um, moment in history. Today, 
strong and powerful as they are, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft do not have fighter jets. They do not have navies with nuclear submarines. They do not have infantry divisions. The East India Company did. Not only did it have an army, a private army, which it ran and trained and armed and, and uh, gave the latest weaponry to, um, it had it in on a vast scale. As it, literally, the East India Company uh, controlled twice as many troops as the British government. Uh, we're not back there yet, but we are in an insidious place where, you know, we are discussing this with our mobile phones. On. We will probably get um, adverts popping up on our social media feed after this conversation, advertising East India Company tea or uh, whatever it is that it latches onto from this conversation that will produce uh, a stream of adverts that we'll be delighted to read over the next two days. Uh, and uh, and, and you know, that extraordinary way that we've all had instances of, we can have a conversation in the presence of our phone and bingo, uh, there's the advert about what we were talking about in our social media feed the next day, whether it's medicine or lingerie <laughs> or uh, a lawnmower or, you know, a light bulb, uh, whatever it is that we've been mentioning in our conversation pops up. Uh, and that is a power, um, this extraordinary power of, of, of surveillance capitalism. Um, and you can argue it both ways. You know, is, is the East India Company had infantry divisions, cavalry and artillery. Google does not. But Google spies on every conversation, listens to every uh, chat we have. It, uh, uh, it harvests every email we write. Extraordinary. It's a very, I mean, it's a very interesting moment in history, uh, sure. uh, and it's fascinating to see the the parallels with the period of the company. But how do you think the world will move ahead from here? Because there is a parallel, of course. Of course, I agree that uh, they don't have uh, what you call armies or whatever, but they actually have uh, absolutely clear thing called as a bots who learn about us, who probably control our behavior, uh, who probably give rise to a certain set of ideas. Uh, and there's that danger as well. In fact, Facebook has actually got used uh, extensively in elections in uh, US or UK. Yeah. Uh, in fact, so how, how do we get out of this? Because uh, history does teach us the ideas to how, how detrimental this can be uh, for our, our society. Well, look, obviously, historians are not seers. They're not prophets who can look into the future. But what we can do is tell you what happened the last time. <laughs> and so with the East India Company, um, First of all, we can tell you the, the, the strong and interesting parallels. For example, um, even before the company became the major force it did in the mid-18th century, it was already avoiding taxes in southern India. And uh, there's an extraordinary moment at the beginning of the 18th century when the company uh, is beginning to throw its weight around uh, from its base in Madras. And the Nawab of the Carnatic one day marches up with his army, surrounds the town, besieges it, and says, you guys haven't paid any taxes for uh, for 10 years. Um, you have broken the charter, which uh, I allowed you to found this town on. And rather than sending out an army, the company sends out one emissary, who's a fluent Persian speaker. Uh, and he tells the Nawab, look, you can bully us all you like. You can invade us. You can enslave us. But if you do so, the weavers who have made so much profit for you and who have provided your income will go away. The, uh, uh, we will move our base to Calcutta uh, and uh, you will cease to have the revenue and the trade that, that uh, we have generated for you. In other words, exactly the same argument that Amazon uses today for not paying taxes, uh, that, it, uh, that if, uh, if you penalize it in one country, it simply moves off to the next one uh, where, it, where it won't be taxed. Um, and then you see the, the story of the company itself. It does have this astonishing power, um, but it is continually in conflict with the power of the state. And the history of the East India Company is the story of the battle between the state and corporate power. And at different times, different ones, different elements win. So within a century of the company being founded in 1599, the directors are put in the in the Tower of London um, in, in the um, 1670s because they are caught bribing MPs. 
they are literally, uh, it's, you know, it's a very modern scenario. It's a, they are caught offering money to MPs uh, who uh, are supposed to vote for the extension of their monopoly. Uh, and it's found the directors are giving bribes and they're put in prison. And this begins the whole industry of corporate lobbying, which exists to this day, whereby um, a company tries to find legal means to influence the political strategy of political parties. And in a democracy, this is very easy because uh, political parties need political donations. And political donations are usually given uh, in that gray area between the promise uh, and the suggestion um, that uh, if, they're, if, if they get into power, uh, that they will do this, that, or the other for the, the company. So you see the beginnings of a world whereby, you know, in 1953 in uh, Iran, MI6 and the CIA collaborate to topple the democratically elected uh, government of Mossadegh in Iran. A year later, uh, they overthrow the, uh, the democratically elected government in Guatemala uh, because they, they're about to nationalize all the banana farms. Uh, and this is where the phrase banana republic comes from, uh, because uh, United Fruit had persuaded the CIA to intervene and, and perform uh, a coup. Um, so this, this world where a corporation can, through its wealth, influence the policies of the nation state and overthrow other nation states just as the East India Company. But we also know from the history of the East India Company that the, these corporations are vulnerable and that just as um, during the subprime collapses uh, of 2008 in uh, at the United States and, and Europe, uh, whereby you know nearly the entire economy of Iceland uh, disappear into a black hole created by bank failure, uh, and where in um, uh, America one had the, you know, the famous collapse of, uh, of, of the big banks and the whole question of who was too big to fail or not. Um, you get that with the East India Company. Uh, and very quickly after, it's at its most powerful. So 17... Um, uh, you, get, you, get, you, get, you get the Battle of Plassey, 1756, and the Battle of Buxar, the second great victory, 1765. In 1770, there's a famine leading to possibly, the estimates vary from one to five million deaths in Bengal. Uh, and in the midst of that famine, uh, the company's revenues obviously plummet down uh, 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 to, to very low levels. And uh, in 1772, the company goes bankrupt and has to go to the Bank of England to be bailed out. So just as you get with these great American corporations, which on one hand look unassailably strong and massively uh, leveraged, um, on the other hand, uh, they prove to be much more vulnerable than they look uh, and need propping up and bailing out, as Matt West, for example, did in Britain. Um, and so the company moves from being this example of absolutely free market libertarian capitalism to being by the 1780s um, half owned by the British government. And that's how the government begins to get involved in India, ultimately leading to total government control when the company is nationalized, although that phrase isn't used, but that's effectively what happens in, in, in uh, uh, 1858. So this is fascinating, uh, again, as I hear this, but you know, like your work has equal impact or, uh, or, or equal visibility in places like India and Pakistan. And of course, when you're talking about East India Company, because there is this part of history, and you also alluded to that your father did see the partition and the mayhem that followed. Uh, my question is, like, how do we get this right? Like, there, there seems to be this huge divergence between these two countries, like probably culturally very, very similar, but how do we really set this right? Uh, again, I'm just seeking an answer, not as a seer, but from a historical yeah. point of view, what seeded it? How do we get it? So, right? While it's certainly true that there are many points of disagreement and particular points of disagreement on history between India and Pakistan, I think the East India Company is not somewhere where they disagree. 
um, this book, this book, which creates a picture of, of, of buccaneering, plundering, looting in, uh, international capitalism was very popular in both countries. The biggest surprise was that it, it worked in countries like America and Britain as well, which, which was not a given. Um, so no, this was this was this book was very much something that, that India and Pakistan could agree on, and uh, um, you know pa uh, Imran Khan was seen um, uh, reading the book and photographed, and, and the book book sales doubled overnight in Pakistan. I, I, so far, Mr. Modi has not been seen reading any book, least of all mine. But uh, um, uh, maybe one day we'll see somebody in the government holding up a copy. Um, but it's. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, this is not a book which, um, which 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 created any disagreement within India and Pakistan. But there is a whole debate now going in Britain, because Britain had this odd seventy years of post-colonialism where it never really faced up to the realities of empire, propelled partly by nostalgic films like uh, *The Jewel in the Crown*. Uh, or the Merchant Ivory films, or Passage to India. Um, the British were fed a version of the Raj, which was basically Sunday night uh, masterpiece theater entertainment. Uh, and suddenly the Raj was turned into this confection of, uh, of elephants and maharajas and croquet lawns and similar and high tea with, uh, with Nawab Saab and... Uh, uh, handsome chaps in khaki and nice ladies in crinolines wandering, gliding over lawns with parasols. And it all looked gorgeous with, you know, colonial furniture and uh, gin fizzes at the club veranda and all that sort of thing. Um, and the British never came to recognize, as the Germans had done with the Third Reich, or as the Belgians had had to do with Congo, that their imperial history was one of exploitation, looting, and plundering. And for 70 years, the British have talked, have, well, not really, they haven't talked about empire. They've, they've, they've quietly sort of glided over empire uh, in the guise of a, a Sunday night film uh, as this sort of pretty confection, uh, but not faced up to it as a serious part of history. And, and, and the empire was simply removed from British history books. No one was taught about the empire at school. Uh, uh, they, there was brief mentions of the emancipation of the slaves um, and Florence Nightingale, and then everyone moved on to the Nazis. So the impression was given in British textbooks that British history's main thrust was liberation and freedom and uh, protecting the world against empire, somehow missing out the elephant in the room that you know Britain had the largest empire in history uh, and that it, uh, helped itself to the minerals and resources of countries you know, on every continent and uh, fought wars on every continent and defeated indigenous armies on every continent and imp imposed its rule. And it's only now, partly because so many Indians are rising to positions of authority in academia, in writing, but also in government in the UK, um, that this the penny is finally dropping that you know the Raj was not a pretty costume drama, but was a matter of exploitation, looting, and plundering, which hugely enriched our country and which turned us from being a marginal power on the edge of Europe to being the richest power in Europe. Um, and that's where our money came from, that and the slave trade. Um, and so when you go to one of those lovely National Trust houses in the summer and, and pay your money and have a cream tea in the tea room and look at this gorgeous Georgian facade, the, the chances are that if it wasn't built by the East India Company, someone who returned from looting Bengal, it, had, it was built by somebody whose who's, who's son or, or uncle or father was a planter in Barbados or Jamaica. Uh, and the money came from the slave trade uh, and, and the sugar plantations or the cotton plant. So these are histories which uh, the British need to face up to. And it's caused a lot of debate in Britain. But again, you know, it, it, I, I, as a Brit whose family was involved in this, um, I have written it, I think, in a manner that was palatable to them. And it's interesting to compare my work to someone like Satnam Sanghera, who is an Indian who writes very similar 
talking about the same subject, but gets bundles of hate mail. Uh, and I think the British are, in a sense, prepared to be told that they were looters and plunderers by one of their own um, with a white face. But when an Indian tries to tell them to them, they get a bit shifty. And, uh, and you begin, you know, the racists break cover and, uh, and write horrible letters. Poor Sutton has been covered with uh, a hideous hate mail, while I have not. I mean, I've had the occasional rude review on Amazon from uh, Imperial Nostalgians. And you will find on Amazon, you know, lots of people saying, oh, this lefty uh, doing down Winston Churchill and the Empire and Clive and so on. And uh, there are those still who, you know, who will resent. But by and large, I've got, you know, frankly got away with it. Um, uh, which Satnam Sanghera has, has found in his post bag to be more difficult entirely because of the color of his skin. Oh, so you're making a very big statement, you know, like in, that's a very powerful statement that that racism is still alive and beating. Well, I don't think, I think it's news, is it? <laughs> but, but people have not wanted to talk about it. Or, sorry? I, th I sort of don't think that is news anywhere in the world. Absolutely, but but how does world overcome this? Because, you know, like this is even after about uh, when we have been talking about all this, like in the last one year, we have seen Black Lives Matter, This uh, the Empire Land comes out and there is this uh, huge hate towards Satnam Sanghera and things. So like, how do we overcome this barrier of thinking? Because once you're talking about it, I have to ask you this question. What, what propels it? Like, how do we get over this? I don't know the answer to how you get over it, other than by writing and 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 you know, defending Sutton's right to to say what he sees. Um, but I, the, I, I know where the problem comes from, which is in the sense that the Britain simply hasn't faced up to this. Mm -hmm. um, there's been this, as I say, this sort of strange double thing whereby the British are very happy to disapprove of colonialism in general and to be strongly disapproving of German colonialism uh, or Belgian colonialism or Dutch colonialism or French colonialism, but somehow persuade themselves the British colonialism was utterly different. Uh, it was all about gin, gin fizz in the club and, um, and I say, beautiful women in Crenley playing croquet. Uh, and that feeling that somehow our empire was different that our empire was fine, is very widespread in Britain. And, and it, it's changing. I and mean, you know, um, I think there is, I mean, everything that I and Sutton have, have said in our books has been, been said by Indian academics for 40 years and by many uh, British academics for 40 years too. But it hasn't made it into the popular mainstream. Uh, there have been, it isn't in school curriculum. Uh, mm -hmm. It isn't taught in school. It isn't on exam paper. Um, and it's only now, bizarrely, that this reckoning has taken place. I mean, for me, it's it's very nice because it's obviously provided a... Uh, Dr. Johnson said that for, uh, for, for uh, a book to be successful, it needs to be like a game of badminton. You need to have uh, people on both sides of the net putting the shuttlecock backwards and forwards. Uh, you, you know, you, you have, in a sense, it... If there is a debate, your book becomes a subject of, uh, of uh, uh, interest and everyone feels they have to read it. Well, if everyone agrees with what you're saying, you know, they can just put it down and not bother to get it up in the first place. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I, in a sense, I'm very happy that this is the case and it provided a, a, an atmosphere where people are buying, buying these books, my book and Sandham's book, um, and, and reading them and, and Agreeing or disagreeing as they as, as they wish, but uh, uh, but it seems odd that it is now in 2021 that this reckoning is taking place when Britain moved out of India in 1947, which is more than 70 years ago. Interesting. And uh, William, as we are coming to the close of the uh, conversation, you know, like just uh, two more questions. Like, could you just tell more about your next body of work that's going to uh, that's happening? Because I do sure. see on Twitter some very interesting things about yakshas, yakshis, <laughs> and nagas, and things. So, like, I've been following your Twitter timeline. So, there's something very fascinating that is seemingly coming. So I've been, I, I, mean, I love Indian, ancient Indian art, and right, and I have collected this stuff and written about it since I first went to India. Um, 
But the main body of my writing, definitely, you know, in books for the last 20 years has been the colonial period. And, and now I've got this done and, and this, you know, the, the final full stop to these four books has been set down and published. Uh, I can pursue these other other things that have been, in a sense, um, you know, dilettante interests on the side. I've always loved Jola Bronzes. I've loved Pahari painting. I've loved uh, um, going around uh, the, the cave temples of Ajanta and Ellora and all this stuff. But I've never written a substantial book about this early period. So I'm now doing that. Um, it's it's very nice after 20 years working in one field to have the freedom to swim in in these other oceans. Um, and lockdown was the perfect opportunity to do that because I was able to just sit on this farm where I'm speaking to you from on the edge of Delhi um, and read and read and read. Um, and the whole, and this time last year, I began working on this and, and have gone through, um, you can see, I will move just you can see my walls of books stretching out. I've had a, the most fascinating lockdown uh, working through all my you know, all the, the great books on early Hinduism, early Buddhism. And the book I'm writing is called The Golden Road. It's the story of how Indian culture diffused around Asia in the early century uh, AD uh, or CE, the Christian era. And um, it's got three parts. The first part is the story of Buddhism and how Buddhism traveled up to become the state religion in China. At the same time, part two tells the story of Hinduism and Sanskrit going through down to Southeast Asia with uh, uh, <coughs> ultimately leading to the building of the largest Hindu temple in the world at Angkor Wat, not in India, but in the jungle of Cambodia. And part three is the story of how Indian numbers, mathematics and astronomy and astrology traveled westwards, first to the Arab world and then from the Arab world into Mediterranean and medieval Europe and how Fibonacci brought what he knew to be Indian numerals, but which Europe called Arabic numerals um, to Europe. Uh, so this is something again that, you know, Indians all vaguely know and are very proud of, but I don't think it's ever been quite pulled together into one uh, readable narrative. Um, and um, I hope to do that. Uh, I'm having a lovely time. The only trouble is I can't get to, at the moment, I was, should now be in Cambodia, uh, but they've just locked up again. And, uh, uh, Thailand looked as if it was opening up, but then that's looking as if it's going to have a third wave now. Indonesia, so on. So I'm I'm in a bit of a fix in that I can, I've got all the materials, academic materials to read here online. And I, I've got one, I mean, over these days, one can access university libraries from your study and, uh, and harvest scholarly journals around the world from anywhere. Um, but I can't write this book unless I've actually, I mean, I've been to Cambodia, I've been to China. I know these areas, but I need to revisit to do this book properly. Uh, so I've been able over the last couple of months to do a lot of travel within India. Uh, mm -hmm. And have been traveling through Madhya Pradesh and Karnataka and Tamil Nadu and, and visiting the you know the earliest Hindu temples and the oldest Buddhist remains. But I have not so far uh, been able to revisit Angkor, Borobudur, um, and the early uh, caves of Western China. Um, and that I'm longing to do. But uh, it's it looking. Uh, I mean, I I would hope I'd imagine this time last year that, that this you know would all have been over and uh, uh, travel would have been possible by now. That's not proving the case. And uh, uh, my son is also a writer, also got an ambitious historical project bubbling. Um, and uh, he has also got the same problem. So we're both sitting here slightly wondering when we're going to be able to get our books researched properly on the ground. I hope, I hope the situation changes uh, soon and you're able to do that. But last question uh, on this uh, for the conversation today, you know, like you did talk about Sanskrit. And I have to uh, ask you a question about a very fascinating author that I've read recently. I, I'm not so sure if you've seen it or not. 
And that's more like translation than uh, he is uh, Vivek de Broy. Uh, how do you really look at his work uh, on translations and importance of it? And then, of course, if I have to ask you a question, what are the three books that you would like to recommend for people to read beyond the quartet? On, on what subjects? Any subject? Or? Absolutely. Three are the most important books that a person should read. Goodness. Uh, okay. So first of all, Bebek, I'm a big fan of Bebek. He, we've had him at the Joyful Literature Festival. He's a hugely admired figure. He's also an unusual figure in that he straddles, uh, obviously, uh, government and, uh, and writing. Um, and, and academia, um, and um, no, I, 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 I'm a big admirer. Um, we had him actually at our Jaipur Literature Festival in January, uh, for, and it was an extraordinary session. I saw it see that you got him too, so you, you've got a treat ahead of you uh, uh, interviewing him. Uh, please tell him I'm a big fan. Um, three books to read uh, on India. Uh, fiction, anything, non-fiction, what? Anything, which but, you feel are the most fascinating three books that any person should read, any topic, any area. If you just have to read three books in your lifetime. Goodness. Um, well, easy first one. Um, boring and predictable in many ways, but no question the greatest novel remains War and Peace. Uh, Tolstoy. Um, so often the great classics disappoint in one way or another. You imagine that uh, you come across uh, uh, something that the world has, says is the greatest this or the greatest that, and it doesn't move you. But I know no one who fails to be moved by War and Peace. It's, it, it's everything a novel can possibly be. And, and for a historian like me, it's uh, also a fantastic lesson in, in history. I don't actually personally agree with Tolstoy's views of history. I, do believe that personalities can change history. I don't believe that everything is um, controlled by invisible forces and that human beings are uh, uh, chaff in the wind of, of, of the gales of history. But uh, I still completely love uh, War and Peace. For a history book, um, not that this is one of the world's great books, but just because it's a book which meant a lot to me and taught me how to write, I would choose Sir Stephen Runciman's Fall of Constantinople, 1453, which for me is just a model of how to write a gripping, well-researched, exciting, beautifully moving history book. Um, what would be my third book? Um, I think for, a, for a, as an example of wide ranging historical writing, um, a recent extraordinary book, I would recommend, I think the book that certainly all my children have enjoyed and I know that uh, millions around the world have is Peter Frankopan Silk Road. Um, uh, just that sensation of someone who has come to grips uh, rather like, um, the incarnation of Vishnu, who strides over three worlds and three great leaps. The Frankopan's Silk Road seems to be able to cross from, you know, the whole of Eurasia uh, in, in a single span, in a single great leap. And um, uh, yes, it's the kind of trivakrama of, uh, of uh, uh, history, history writing. Um, so maybe that would be my third choice. But uh, uh, yeah, it's impossible just to, to 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 name three books, but those certainly books which have, have have meant a lot to me personally. Thank you, William. This this has just been such an exciting interaction. I think I've absolutely been enthralled with, with the ideas that you've shared. In fact, uh, I, I must say, like uh, uh, this has just been one of those influential talks which I'm going to stay with for a very or interaction. Thank you, sir. Thank you very, you very much. You're very kind. And uh, I hope we are able to meet in person once the lockdown is over and probably be part of Where the are you talking from, Ahmed? Uh, I'm in Delhi itself. Uh, but oh, you're then, in Delhi? We could have done uh, this face-to-face -face part for this. I didn't realize. Yes, we, are, we are going to be really uh, doing... Uh, I would request for a face-to-face -face sometime soon. We'll push it up on uh, economic uh, ET now. Uh, so we will do that. But then I hope we are able to do much more interactions, many more to come. And uh, let's meet over a cup of coffee sometime soon. Thanks. Well, so we, can, we can manage something stronger after that, I think. Absolutely. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. So, so kind Thank of you. you. Be well and be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.